Welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. My name is Audrey Monkey, and I am your host. On the Sunshine Parenting Podcast and website, I research, write, speak, and interview podcast guests on the topics of parenting, summer camp, and happiness. This is episode 12 of the podcast, and I'm interviewing author Kathleen Buckstaff, who recently published the book, Get Savvy, Letters to a Teenage Girl About Sex and Love. I'm so excited to have Kathleen Buckstaff on the podcast today. She has an excellent new book that she wrote called Get Savvy. And I read it about a month ago and also had my 18-year-old daughter read it. And it's just a phenomenal book. Kathleen and I were classmates um, back at Stanford, but really weren't close back then and reconnected a couple years ago when I heard about her writing this book. And we have since formed a very close friendship, and I'm really excited to talk with her today. So Kathleen, to start with, can you just introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are and what you're doing? Well, thank you so much for having me, Audrey, and I'm excited to be here to talk about Get Savvy. I am a mother. I've got three young adult children. I live in Northern California, and right now I'm focusing my time on sharing the collective wisdom that's in this book, and so I'm happy to talk about it. Yes, it's so it's so exciting, and I think we've talked before about how you're really kind of a unique voice on this topic right now, so it's very exciting to um, that you're going to be able to share what you're writing about. So why don't you start by just telling us why you decided to write the book, Get Savvy? Well, basically, uh, my daughter had just graduated from college, and she came to me and shared with me that a lot of her... Um, closest friends had gone through some really hard experiences when they were in college and that that a lot of them had not had conversations at home around sexual assault or sexual predators and that it was something I had talked to her a lot about before leaving home and I'd also actually talked to some of her girlfriends before they, they left home as well and she came and asked me to write a book and Initially, I wasn't going to share my own story. I started interviewing recent graduates and current college students. And um, eventually, it was my daughter again who asked me to share my own story as well because she said she thought it would give me give the book more credibility. And um, what happened was when I was in high school, I attended a New England prep school. I was sexually assaulted by a student. And then when I was a senior, I was sexually abused by a teacher there. And I um, really don't want what happened to me to happen to anyone else. So I've written a series of letters in a book to a teenage girl about sex and love, teaching them what I wish I had known. Well, and I, I think I've shared with you, um, the way the book is written is just so excellent because you really get drawn into the story, but you weave in all this great advice from other young women. And I really like how you use all those interviews to kind of, you know, you're from your perspective, looking back on your days in high school and college, and then sharing kind of current issues that these same, you know, girls are facing now. It was really the narrative. It really grabbed you. Most, most books like this, you know, you kind of pick up and put down. And like I said, I picked yours up and I could not put it down. I had to read through all the way to the end. Oh, I, I'm, I've been, I've been relieved and delighted to hear that. So I've, I bet most people get to page 105 in their first reading. And I'm not sure what it is <laughs> about 105 where they, they actually stop and take a breath. So that's, it's been a relief to me that people are, you know, really reading it, um, in a, and actually boys and dads are reading it too. And what happened was, is that I realized I was from a silent generation where we didn't talk about these hard subjects. And, um, and I grew up learning that sexual assault or rape was something that happened, um, by someone you didn't know in a dark alley. And the statistics just don't bear that out. We're, Unfortunately, 93% of sexual assaults committed um, to a juvenile or someone known that that, that victim person knows. Mm-hmm. And so we really need to change how we talk about this um, among our children, among ourselves, in our schools, in our communities, so that we're looking at what the actions of a predator are and not who that person is. 
Mm-hmm. And there are things that we can do um, to identify predators, traits, tactics, and tricks. And so I really go through that, and I'm weaving in um, examples of things that happened to me and other students as a way of using it as a teaching tool to see to see how predators behave. Um, uh, we do historically think of, of a predator only using physical force, but there are much more subtle forms of manipulation that can be used to coerce somebody, um, and we call that a persuasion predator. And mm-hmm. and so we're looking at, you know, somebody pushing drinks, are they ignoring your no, are they trying to get you alone? And then even more um, sophisticated forms, you know, writing you love letters, giving gifts, and then and then eventually going for social or sexual coercion. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's different things we can teach, but I think it's more compelling if it's in, in story form. So then people can relate and talk about it um, more. Um, than just giving them facts. Oh, definitely. And I think um, young women reading it often can relate to the situations that you talk about or they have a friend who's Mm -hmm. been in that situation. So I Mm -hmm. think it's very relatable and so, so important. So what are some of the other important things that you want people to know um, who read your book? Well, basically, I want us to change how we think about predators so that we we can then talk to we can talk to our daughters and sons so that our daughters are aware that it's most likely somebody that they know who will be approaching them in a way that's that's not okay or illegal or both and and for our sons to be willing to step up and intervene and not look the other way or laugh and and the interesting thing with this book is that boys are reading it. I've got two different fraternities that are reading it this summer. I've got dads that are reading it. I was horrified first when dads started reading the book because I really was thinking my target people were mothers and daughters. And I mm-hmm. share such personal stories in it that I was, you know, really feeling like, okay, I can write this. I can share this with the girls. I can share this with the mothers. And then all of a sudden I've got college boys and dads reading it. And, um, and that's really good news because, and educators, so principals and counselors as well are looking at how to integrate it into their curriculum because what it does is it, it gives these really true stories on tough topics so that we can see that in any kind of sexual interaction, um, two people are involved and two people really matter. And so I'm really looking at, well, what does it mean when somebody is a conquest male versus a noble male? And what does predatory behavior look like? And then what are the long-term consequences of that? And what are things that we can do to prevent it and intervene? And so the first half of the book is really where I go through the story of what happened to me and one of my closest friends when we were in high school. And then the second half of the book is set up as a workbook where I go through um, four different words, respect, discernment, boundaries, and love. And I write different letters on those, and I ask different reflection questions to build a toolkit of resilience so that we're really developing this deep feeling of self-love and self-caring. And then how do we share that in a way with other people? And then how do we go about defining our boundaries to take care of ourselves and take care of our friends? So it's a whole it's a whole system of being that is looking for um, reducing reducing suffering or harm, and then um, creating healthier relationships as a result of these new tools that we're learning. Oh yeah, and I think so. It's well, very well set up to ha- open up those discussions, whatever group with either parents and their children or at schools. So that's great how you have that set up in the back part. So you mentioned briefly, I just want you to talk again about the conquest male versus the noble male and some of the statistics on that. Because I think one thing, whenever we get on these topics, oftentimes people start doing kind of like blanket generalizations about all boys or men. And I really like how you make a distinction in your book. So can you just talk a little bit more about the difference between what you call a conquest male and a noble male? Well, a conquest male is, is, is somebody who's interested in a sexual, uh, in a sexual act, and they're treating the person as if they're an object. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is a sexual predator. They are, but they are using sex 
for whatever reason, to brag about it with their friends, for sexual gratification, and they're not caring about the person that they're with. So it's about the conquest. It's about bragging rights. And it's usually done to feel better about themselves among their male peers. So that has nothing to do with the, with the young woman that they're with mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. or their partner. Mm-hmm. And, and so a noble male is somebody who's willing to delay sexual gratification and get to know the other person and cares about the other person's needs and goals and dreams and desires. And so a noble person, a noble male is, is, um, is, is willing to delay the sexual gratification and is not using sexual the, any kind of sexual act as bragging rights. Mm-hmm. And a conquest male is somebody who is likely to become a sexual predator. And so that's, you know, there's different characteristics that, that are more likely in somebody who is a sexual predator where they have a hyper sense of masculinity, they're bragging about their sexual conquest, they think it's a game to, you know, to get somebody drunk and then have sex with them, which is against the law and illegal and immoral. Um, and but I don't see it as rape. And so there's different ways of identifying this behavior. And and we can and I think unfortunately right now in our, our culture, there's there can be so much anger applied at all men or all guys are this way. And statistically that's not true. We're looking at between six and ten percent of the male population are sexual predators. And and so and and most often they're repeat offenders. So that's how you get the higher numbers among the women who are sexually assaulted. And also men are as well. So it's important to not leave that as a silent topic. So ninety percent of all all rape victims are female and ten percent are male. Mm. And and so and most often they are sexually assaulted by another man. Mm-hmm. Um and so when we're looking at sexual predators behavior, it's, it's, it's important to understand that it's not the entire male population at all. And what I want to do is I want to call out these noble males and, and understand that there's a lot of really good guys out there. There's good men out there who really care about these issues who in a sense are looking to be empowered to how do they speak up? How do they, you know, give them, give them a voice as well so that they're not silent when they see somebody making jokes or calling a woman names or bragging about a sexual conquest so that it becomes socially cool to say, hey, that's not okay. One fraternity created a policy that was called no drunk sex. And so if any couples were headed off to a room together and one or both of them were drunk, it was seen as a really good brotherly act for another fraternity member to go intervene and say, Hey, this isn't a good idea to go off together because it wasn't good for, it wasn't safe or good for either person involved. And so that's a very different way of, um, under understanding that all humans are these beautiful, intricate people that are worthy of deep, deep respect and treating them with kindness and dignity instead of an object and something that's worth bragging rights, which is a mm-hmm. very degrading way of treating any person. Mm-hmm. And and we need to re- really reduce that and, re- and reduce our cultural approval of that sexualization of another person. Definitely. So when you, um, so, you know, one of the things as I was reading it, I was thinking, okay, of course I want my kids to read this. And I ended up talking to my teenage sons about it as well. When you're when you wrote this book, uh, what age group were you thinking about reading it or who were you wanting to read it? You know, that's a really good question. Um, some of this will require, uh, I really believe is, you know, the parents need to decide what they think their kids are ready for. But I would also add that parents are, that our kids unfortunately are exposed to a lot of things out of our control now with social media and phones and and so they're they're exposed to pornography at really young ages. They're getting a lot of sexual messages through music video and TV shows and movies. And so we really need to be having these conversations a lot earlier than we're comfortable. The, the conversations are always uncomfortable, but I know that I'm encountering mothers when I'm doing book readings who are saying, "Well, my daughter's too young." And their daughters are maybe 15 or 16. And unfortunately, I know that girls 
between the ages of 14 and 18, so 14 years old and 18 years old, are four times more likely than anyone in the general public of being raped or sexually assaulted. And and 90, 93% of those people are people that they know. So that means we need to be talking to our 13 and 14 year olds about this to help prepare them so that they're not, um, so that they have tools of things they can do or that they can intervene on behalf of a friend because teenagers are really likely to share with a friend if something's not going right or if they've been sexually assaulted. I have um, a neighbor friend, uh, her daughter just read my book and she's a sophomore in high school and she finished reading it and she came to me and she said, you know, Kathleen, I, she was in, almost in tears and she said, I needed to read this book two years ago. And I looked at her and I said, when you were in eighth grade and she said seventh or eighth grade, she said, yes, my best friend came to me and told me she'd been raped by a sophomore boy who was a family friend and I didn't know what to say. And I, and she, and I, you know, said, Oh, it's not your fault. How could you know what to say? You know, we don't even know what to say, but I do cover in my book, you know, what to say if a friend comes to you, what to say and do if a friend comes to you and says she's been sexually assaulted, or if you think a friend has an eating disorder, what to say or do, or if you think a friend may be suicidal, what to say and do. Mm -hmm. Because teenagers, I talk about them being the first friend responders. Mm -hmm. They often will confide in a, pe a peer and not their parent. And so we need to give them tools and skills of what to say and then how to be a bridge and go get help and not try to handle the weight of those problems on their own. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of tools in here and there's a lot of language. There's language around, around, you know, communicating sexual disinterest and interest. You know, yes, I'm comfortable kissing you, but I don't want to do anything else. You know, or I need you to stop doing that now. It's making me uncomfortable. You may not mean to be un making me uncomfortable, but you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, defining, using words and gestures to define boundaries is really important. And role playing is important. So I really advocate role, role playing. Um, so going back to your question of like, who who's the right age to read that this book? Um, I would say any student in high school and certainly college people and quite honestly I have a woman from a garden gardening group and, and they're in their 70s and she asked me if I'd come speak to them mm -hmm. about my book and I said of course I will and she said well we all had these things happen to us and we never talked about it oh and we really need to we need to oh my gosh and, and that's so, so that healing was really yeah. Touching. Uh, yeah it was really powerful she had tears in her eyes she had read the back of my book and Ask me if I can speak to her garden group. Mm. And I have a lot of grandmothers purchasing the book for their granddaughters. Mm. You know, so they really want to be part of this conversation. And then a really important point to bring up is that um, no matter what we teach or say to our daughters or sons about a sexual predator, at the end of the day, it is always the moral and legal responsibility that that blame for for a course of act is completely the fault of the person who commits the crime. It is always the predator's fault and responsibility. So, so there are things that we can do that reduce our risk, and and we now know that. And and so I'm focused on that. How do we reduce our risk? There's one professor, Charlene Sin, out of Canada. She sent. 10 years creating a sexual assault resistance training program and testing it and testing it and testing it. And finally it was successful. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And she had a 12 hour program and where she trained incoming freshman girls and four different universities in Canada. And after 12 hours of training, four different sessions, she was able to reduce the completed rates by almost 50%. Mm. And that's astounding. So from my perspective, if we've got one in five girls who are being sexually assaulted, and if we can reduce that in half by doing a better job of how we talk about sexual assault and how we role play and how we train, um, how we learn that it's usually somebody we know, we learn things to say, we learn self-defense, what to do, we learn how to in intervene on behalf of a friend. 
we learn how to get out of bad situations early. So we learn how to exit early. You know, there's things we can do that reduce our risk. Um, does it take the complete risk away? No. But, but we can do that. And then we also know how to get help so that instead of like in my situation where help wasn't available and problems really fasted in and surfaced a lot later in major ways, we know that we know how to help people who have been sexually assaulted in a way that is profoundly loving and kind and when we direct them to the right resources. Mm -hmm. And so part of my book is, is creating that bridge as well. Oh, yes. And I, you know, I, um, I really want to get your book in the hands of every parent of middle schoolers so that the parents read it and sort of understand what's either already starting on some level or mm -hmm. will be starting once their kids get to high school. So I've actually, mm -hmm. I need to buy my new copy because I just passed it along to a friend with an eighth grader. <laughs> I love that. Um, and yeah. I, and I recommend the same thing that you did. I think as parents read this book to be aware of what's going on and mm -hmm. so that then, and then have your kids read it. And I'd say boys and girls, and then use that discussion. Those Absolutely. discussion questions, because, you know, my boys, I want them to be those noble males. I want them to be right. that. And I want my girls to be discerning. And I want them to have the words mm -hmm. that you provide in that book, which that is something mm -hmm. I've never seen before. I've heard the statistics and, um, you know, seen the documentaries about college rape and all this. But then your book gives words for the girls to use very early in situations. And that is the part that I Oh think yeah, there's really... lots of tools. Mm -hmm. This is everything I wish I had known. Mm -hmm. I've written the book that I needed as a teenage girl. So this these are I have I have I have gone all over the all over the world searching for people who have language and words where I did not and where they could have said things, you know, early and done things early and noticed early signs. You know, if somebody is ignoring your no and you're trying to keep their hand away from your bra or your breasts or your pants and you're trying to push them away with your hands. It's really awkward and comfortable to say something, but that's not a person you want to stay with. That's somebody who is trying to control you sexually and you need to leave. And I go through different examples of, of rules that girls can use and then ask them to role play, role play with their parents, role play with their friends so that they can get comfortable getting out of these awkward situations early and, and hopefully preventing future harm. And I have, I have to tell you, I have had parents of kids very, very young ages. So, so, you know, preschool kids read the book, read the book and say that they are learning language about bodies and, and boundaries on bodies that they're able to teach their little ones. Um, from the book of, of, you know, saying, you know, you're making me uncomfortable. That's not okay. You need to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? and, and, you know, and, you know, understanding those, that language and also just learning how to trust our bodies, trust our instincts, trust our gut, listen to our gut, you know, listen to our hearts. Uh, you know, um, there's a different way of being in the world that I really advocate in this book. Um, that I think provides um, a personal sense of respect and integrity and self-care that's quite high. Mm. Well, it's just an amazing book that I want to get basically in everyone's hands. So I'm going to continue. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to continue telling everyone I know about it and encouraging people to read it. Your message is so important to get out into the world right now. And I am so thankful that you took what was really a, a very difficult and challenging and tragic situation in your own life and turned it around into a book that I think we will never know how many, um, how much heartbreak you prevent by writing this mm. book and sharing it and the healing that you'll provide from anyone from kids now to people in the garden club. <laughs> so I mm -hmm. am just so thankful to you, Kathleen, for your book. And I'm just wishing you just great success with just continuing to get the word out and getting book clubs going at schools and fraternities and everywhere all over the place just to get your message out. It's such an important one. Well, Audrey, thank you so much for having me here. And I, I do want to share the idea that uh, several moms um, that I know are having, they're calling it, it's time to get savvy parties. And so they're having these get savvy parties where they're, 
you know, introducing the book and sharing it with all their friends. Mm. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, um, they, you can get it on Amazon and you can also read excerpts from it on Amazon. If you click on the look inside features, I think that starts to give a good, I, a good sampling of the texture of the stories that are shared and the kinds of um, reflection questions that are offered. Um, you can look at it there. Okay. Amazing. Is there anywhere else? Do you have a website or anywhere else where people can find you to hear more about? Yes, what you're doing? I, have, I have a website, which is Kathleen Buckstaff.com. And I also have an Instagram, which is walk savvy and Twitter is walk savvy, walk savvy girls. And um, so I'm building the walk savvy website right now as well. And um, just helping to kind of, you know, create a community around what it means to be caring and respectful of ourselves and others as we, as we live in life. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Kathleen. I'm going to share all the notes um, on my website. So with the links to all of your different social media outlets, and I can't wait to see your new website. And I will definitely be following you there and all the work that you're doing. And we'll continue to spread the word about Get Savvy to all the young women I know and the parents in my life. So thank you so much for being on today. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to talk with Kathleen about Get Savvy, and I hope her message gets out to so many families and kids who need to hear her words. For notes and more information on this episode of the podcast, visit my website at sunshine-parenting.com and search for episode 12. I'm going to end this episode with a quote from Kathleen's book about respect. The quote comes from both Irene Tsai and from Kathleen. Every person, every peer, every friend, even if they're not a friend, whenever you go out, care for the well-being of others and yourself. Mm-hmm.